John with me this morning, please. Chapter number two, John's Gospel. Chapter number two and verse number one. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Look at verse 4. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And then in verse number 11, the Apostle John wants you to know that this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Father, bless this holy book now. Give me unction to preach it. In thy name I pray, amen. Now when you look at the Bible dispensationally, if you'll notice, we have a marriage taking place. And notice that the Apostle John wants you to know that it was on the third day. Well, when you look at the, the dating in the Bible, how God breaks up seven, it's four and three, four and three, four and three. And right now we are at six thousand year total and we are looking at the millennium we're looking at a marriage that's about to take place so this is a great type here looking into the future the prophecy of it but what we're going to deal with this morning is the gospel of john notice the name john john ione it means beloved of god his counterpart in the old testament where it says plainly that god loved him was daniel for the bible says to daniel thou art greatly loved it was John that laid his head on the breast of Christ. John was definitely, without question, different from the other apostles. The Gospel of John is not in what's called the Synoptic Gospels. Now, Synoptic Gospels is a completely, totally uh, created term. There's no basis for it in the Bible. But anyway, they classify Matthew, Mark, and Luke as Synoptic Gospels. Synopsis, a one view. And this is what they say, but they throw John out, some of the scholars do, and say that it really doesn't even belong to the canon of Scripture because it is so different. It's different because it's dealing with a different issue. The Gospel of John uses the word believe over and over and over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, some say hundreds of times in its different forms, the Greek word is pistis. Pistis can be translated believe or faith. Listen carefully now. Pistis is simply a Greek word. It means faith or believe. The word believe shows up time and time again in the Gospel of John. The word faith doesn't show up one time in the Gospel of John. That's something to think about. So what do you mean? Well, have you heard people of faith? Have you heard that term used today? Of course you have. This is, they create terms and they teach you by these terms and they lead you by these terms. So what does people of faith mean? It means nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because you can have faith in your dog and be part of the people of faith. Amen. John is issue, his, the issue with John is believe. Believe has an object. Who are you going to believe or what are you going to believe? This is what John is emphasizing. This is what it's about. These things are written that you might believe. Pistis. You might believe. Believe what? This is what John wants you to understand because this is the issue at hand. So the Gospel of John starts out telling you that the first miracle that the Lord Jesus Christ performed was turning water into wine. You've heard the term that you cannot put new wine into old jugs or old bottles bottles because they won't hold it. It won't, t it won't work and it will not work. You have to put new wine into new bottles. So what have you got? You've got the beginning of something new here. The Bible says that the law came by Moses. Amen. But grace and truth by Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're opening up something new here. The Lord Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. All the Old Testament perfections and, 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 and things that, uh, that mattered are now in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. So was there, was there mercy? Was there grace and truth in the Old Testament? Absolutely. No question about it. No man's ever been saved on this earth without grace. Amen. No man's ever earned his way to heaven. It's impossibility. But you see, the Old Testament did not have a person that was grace. They did not have a person that was truth. But we do now. 
So when I preach believe, I'm not preaching about believing in a thing or a doctrine or a catechism or a church or a ministry. I'm talking about belief in a person. And this is what the gospel of John is about. This is what John wants you to understand. That he gives you these miracles to show you something that you, who you need to believe in. Water into wine, therefore, is the first miracle. What does that mean, preacher? That means that everything else that follows in the Gospel of John is going to be part of something new, some approach that's new, some object that's new, some new way of dealing with humanity, and it has to be. John chapter number three, the Lord said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. There can be no new birth without the Lord Jesus Christ, period. It cannot happen. And the new birth is based in Entirely upon the new covenant, the new testament. And so this, my friend, is what's important. John chapter number three. This is why the gospel of John doesn't say one word about these last days. Have you studied that? There are books in the New Testament that talk about these last days. And this is not a derisive way. This is simply saying there's a comparison here. The gospel of John is not interested in these last days. It's interested in opening up the future for you, the church of God, and for anyone that does believe. Are you a believer today? That's the issue. Once you've read the gospel of John, search your heart and your soul. And can you say to yourself, I do believe. And this is my testimony this morning. And it will be till I leave this world. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Babe, that's me. I don't know where you fit in that, but that's me. I certainly believe, but I do need help in the areas of unbelief, uh, weak faith in my life and in my soul. Glory to God. Do I ever need the Lord? I need God and you need God. We need the Holy Ghost. We need, we are people in need. Amen. So this is the beginning of miracles, the Apostle John tells us. These are sign miracles. They're for signs. The second miracle the Lord performs, he heals the nobleman's son. The nobleman's son is healed. And when he heals him, uh, my friend, we open up a door now. It is no longer go not in the way of the Gentiles. Now we have a Gentile that's being healed. Amen. His son. So we have a different approach now. This gospel doesn't start off like Matthew does. When Matthew called his 12 and gave them power and anointed them and said, go not in the way of the Gentiles, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You won't find that in John. Search it through. It's not to be found. What he does say say is that a nobleman's son was healed. The third uh, uh, miracle we find in the gospel of John is the healing of a man at the pool of Bethesda. I've been privileged to be there. Glory to God, that was quite a thing to see. You look down to see the pool of Bethesda. 2,000 years ago, Bethesda was down there. You see what happens in the Holy Land, and for example, Megiddo, is that every time they come in and destroy, they build back on top. They destroy again, they build back on top. And it's called a tell. A tell is a man-made hill or a mountain that begins to build. For example, Megiddo has distinct 23 layers of civilization. Don't you think that's something remarkable? And it's the same thing in Jerusalem. Uh, layer upon layer upon layer so you can look down and you can see the pool of Bethesda. If you read your Bible, you think, my goodness, that's where that man was, at the pool of Bethesda. And he couldn't walk, he couldn't get to the water. But the Lord Jesus Christ, you see, my dear friend, is Bethesda. Yes, he is Bethesda. Bethesda means a house of mercy. Amen. And it was not a house of mercy for him. He'd been there all these years. But when the Son of God showed up, mercy came with him because he is mercy. He's the personification of mercy. And so this brings us into something else that we're learning from the Gospel of John. The fourth miracle, he feeds 5,000 plus the women and the children in John chapter number 6. And a great truth is taught to us from the, from the sixth chapter of John. Listen carefully to this now. He feeds them all these this multitude they eat and they have uh, they have fragments left over he said gather them up and then he enters into a doctrine with these Pharisees and with the Sadducees and with the Jewish elders and the leaders about the manna that came down from heaven and the bread of life and then he tells them I am that manna that came down from heaven I am that bread of life you ate Moses manna 
and you got hungry again, but you take this manna in and you'll never get hungry again. It's not going to happen. But I want you to notice what he said to them. In, in, uh, it's quite a remarkable thing. He said to them, in, he said, you believe. He said you, he said, you search me out. This multitude that had just eaten all this food. He said, you search me out. Not because of the miracles that I perform. He said, you search me out because I filled your belly. That's what he said to them. Boy, you talk about a rebuke. That's a rebuke. Now, now what do you mean? Well, they're not living any higher than a dog. They're not living up to what they are. We're men. We're created in the image of God. We've got a much higher calling than the animal on four legs that runs around us. You know what's happening to you, don't you? You live in a culture in America that blurs the distinction between a man and an animal. Get ready for what's coming. That's where you live. And the Lord Jesus said to them, you don't seek me because you saw something supernatural, something that would cause you to think, something that would make you ask questions and reach out, but you seek me because I fed your belly. And that's what's wrong today. The Bible talks about their God being their belly. Amen. That's a sad state of affairs. But then he walks on water in John chapter number six. John's full. The sixth chapter of John's loaded. Here he is walking on water. You see, these things are written that you might believe. Believe what? He's Lord over creation. That's what to believe. He says to the wind, peace be still. And it stops. The wind has no intelligence. Wind can't understand him. So what did he do? He sent out a creative word. The same word that he made everything with. He says to it, stop. And it stopped. Believe me. And the time comes when he puts one foot on earth and one foot on the sea and declares, time, stand still. Time, be no more. Who is it that can stop time? Well, he did. Joshua in the Old Testament cried out for God to stop and he did. Stop the sun, moved it back. So he is the Lord of creation. He can walk on water. In John chapter number nine, he heals the man born blind. He heals a man that is born blind. This man is a type of the Israel and their blindness and spiritual, spirituality 2,000 years ago. But you see, Siloam is brought to the front here. Siloam means sent of God. Now we can put Bethesda with Siloam. And we've got the two of them. One is the mercy of God. God is a gracious God. God heals at Bethesda. But now he said, I have come. The Father hath sent me. I am the sent one. Did you know the Lord Jesus Christ is called an apostle? He's called an apostle. Just like all the other apostles. And the word apostle, apostello, means a sent one. He has been sent to us. And so now the gospel of John is beginning to pull us into something that we better pay a special attention to. And that is that he heals a man that is born blind. In plain words, he said if you're blind, he can give you sight. Are you blind? Here's the problem. People are blind and don't know it. That's the sad thing. Just as blind as a bat and you don't know it. Just as ignorant as you can be and don't have a clue. These things that you don't know, you don't know them because you don't know that you don't know them. <laughs> Amen. You don't know where to search. You don't know where to look. You don't know what you're looking for. How could you? You don't even know it exists. And the only way that you will know it exists is when he makes it known to you. Amen. What a blessedness from God. When he reveals to you that something does exist that you had no clue about. And this is what John's about. And then we come to the ninth chapter of John and that, then the eleventh chapter of John. And Lazarus is raised from the dead. He that was dead came forth. He'd been dead for four days. Here we have him now showing you that he is not only the Lord of creation. He's not only the one, my dear friend, who is the bread of life. Now we have him telling you, I am the God Almighty. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. The hour, the hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. Amen. That voice, amen. Amen. You'll hear it. Everybody will hear it. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. And his word spoke into the tomb of a dead man who did not have an ear to hear it. There was nothing in that tomb but a dead body. He called Lazarus back from where Lazarus was. 
Where was he? He was in the heart of the earth. That's where he was. He was in paradise. He was in Abraham's bosom. And when he spoke and called him forth, he came forth. And Lazarus came up from the dead. And when he did, he witnessed the resurrection and the life. They stood there and they saw that and they believed. They rejoiced. Many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that even if you see somebody come forth from the dead, your heart is so hard, so blackened in sin, so dead, that even though you see somebody resurrected from the dead, you won't believe. Amen. Well, then how can you believe? I'll show you that in just a moment. You see somebody raised from the dead. Do you remember what the rich man said to, Lazarus, to, said to Abraham? You remember what he said? He said, let me go back and warn my five brethren lest they come to this awful, awful, awful place of torment. Let me ask you a question. Take this into your soul and meditate on what I'm saying. Do you believe in hell? Yes, sir. Do you really believe in hell? Yes, sir. Have you really thought about hell? Have you thought about going to a place where you're going to scream and burn? That's no human tongue can, no human mind can take, you can't take that in. You can't take it in. I was looking at a photograph yesterday of uh, three Russian generals and they were looking at a, just looked like ashes. Three Russian generals looked like ashes. But it said this was one of their cosmonauts that had gone up and they heard him screaming and begging for mercy as he came down. And all they had left was just a pile of ashes. Looked like a piece of burnt meat. That's all they had. And you know what went through my mind when I saw that? Hell. I don't want to go to hell. You're insane if you want to go to hell. You're crazy if you think that, 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 that you can handle hell. You're crazy if you don't think about right now that if you die, if you die in your sin, that you'll go to hell. Doesn't that bother you? Have you ever been burned? Do you understand what it means to be burned? How could such a thing be so, preacher? I didn't say it. God said it. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. But what? The wrath of God abideth on him. I didn't say that. I'm not, I'm not good enough to judge like that. I'm just a man like the rest of you. That's not my call. That's not, I'm just up here preaching the word of God to you. But you don't want to go to hell. They watched a man rise from the dead. And they still ran off and told their bosses about it and did not believe. Are you beginning to get a hold now what John's about? That you might believe? Are you, getting, are you beginning to get a hold of this? The Bible says, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Boy, what a thing. I mean, what more do you need? What do you need? But the thing is, you see, you can fake a miracle. So is there anything any stronger than that? Well, let's look at something. Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Now listen, and of the joints and marrow, now here's important, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I want you to take hold of that book for just a moment. Just put it in your hand and think, that's the Word of God. Yes, it is. And it's alive. Does it bother you? That book's alive. So what do you mean alive? Once you take it into your soul, you've got a living thing that came into you. This is where faith comes from. This is what belief is about. You see, John said these things are written that you might believe. We've got John. Aren't you glad you got John? Aren't you glad you weren't born some pagan country where all you got is a bunch of pagan garbage out there in religion, but you've got the Word of God? Amen. Amen. The Word of God. The Word of God is alive. So let's look at that for a moment. Let's look at it. The Scripture. This is the Scripture. I believe the Bible. Amen. Amen. I believe it. I, believe, I mean, I believe the Bible. Sometimes I read things in the Bible that just literally make me, draws me up when I think about it. When I think about somebody going to hell 
and really put my mind into it and think about it, it scares you to death. Aren't you glad you're not going to hell? So how do I know I'm not going to hell, preacher? You ought to know that. If I have to tell you that this morning, you need to make sure before you walk out of this building. You, you need to know that. You see, people use the scriptures for many different reasons. Some want to win an argument. They'll take the Bible, open it up. They'll argue with you all day long about, uh, about all kinds of things from scripture. Because the scripture is not written to make a Baptist out of you. You're a Presbyterian, a Methodist. What's it written for, preacher? To reveal God to us. That's what. But in a lot of different ways. Some use the scripture to prepare for their denominational advancement. In other words, they become part of the system, whatever it is. Some use scripture to find fault. They don't like what you're doing. They're going to find something in the Bible to throw in your face. You ever had that happen to you? Amen. Oh, yeah. You'd give it time. <laughs> somebody out there don't like you and somebody out there is going to wear you out. You say, preacher, I can't believe nobody, everybody doesn't like me. It'll, if, I, if, I, if I listened to everything you said to me, I'd never preach again. You have to get kind of like an armadillo. Just kind of let it bounce off. That's what you got to do. You got to do it. Some use the scriptures as a reference work. What's a reference work? Well, they, it took nearly 4,000 years to write it. It's a good place to start if you want to do some, do some research. It covers a vast number of people, all humanity on this earth. Everybody's name's not in it, but everybody that's ever lived is in it in the sense that all humanity's covered by it. As a reference work, though Israel dominates the text, there are certain people mentioned in the Bible, Nimrod, Nebuchadnezzar, Moab. The Moabite stone is quite a thing. You ought to get home and type a Google the Moabite stone. You'd be amazed at what all is in a secular stone that was found in the 1800s that completely completely supports the scripture like you point, 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 like you wouldn't believe. The Moabites, you know, the, Mo the Moabites were enemies of Israel. Then there's Pharaoh, Caesar Augustus, and on it goes. All kinds of names in the Bible. These are secular names that have secular history. Herodotus is called the father of history, one of them. And Herodotus mentions, mentions many of these people that's found in the Bible. Many of them found in the Word of God. They just recently unearthed in Egypt a Roman city, just recently in the Valley of the Kings, that's 2,000 years old. And they're amazed at all the stuff they're finding. Coins and all of this, it's there. And uh, they have just recently, in this, I think in this year, year before, they have recently found 80 or so mummies in Egypt. It's beginning like the earth is just beginning to unfold. And, and, and just bring all this out for people to see it and read it. It's almost like the Almighty's given one more gracious shot to these unbelieving, dying pagans. He's opening it up. The Word of God, some use it to justify their sin. Have you ever heard a homosexual say that Jesus never said anything about sodomy? Have you ever heard that? He did say this. He says, not one jot or one tittle of the Word of God will fail till it be fulfilled. He's quoting the Pentateuch. He's quoting... The, the law and the prophets. He's quoting the Old Testament scriptures that cannot be broken. Did he believe the Bible? He said, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and there are they that testify of me. So what do they do? They go in there and nitpick, nitpick and try to say, well, because he didn't mention it specifically, that meant that he approved of it. Not so. Let me tell you something. It doesn't take any more grace to save a sodomite than it does a fornicator or a drunkard or a wife beater. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, the Lord Jesus Christ is the grace of God. This is the thing. Let me try to say, what I'm trying to say is this. If you're sitting on this front row and you're a murderer, you're a homosexual, you're a, you're a serial fornicator, you're, you're a thief, you're whatever, it doesn't take any more of the grace of God to save any one of you than it does the other. 
and he's just as willing. He died for every one of us and the grace of God that bringeth salvation, the blood of Christ will cleanse the murderer to the fornicator, the homosexual, the liar, the thief, whatever. The blood of Christ will cleanse all sin. Amen. 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 So some use it for that. Certain themes in the Bible appear. The theme of, theme of Satan, fallen angels, salvation. The uh, scarlet thread, that's a wonderful study. And then the Savior. A book that it took, it took uh, almost 4,000 years to write. You know it's going to cover a lot of ground, don't you think? The most important thing in Scripture is this. For you and for me. Nobody's going to master that Bible. Nobody's ever going to know everything in that Bible. Nobody's ever, it's not going to happen because it's a living book. The most important thing, though, that Scripture will do for you, you'll get a good picture of yourself. Yeah, you will. And let me say this this morning for some of you. Bless your heart. I don't hate anybody in this house, but some of you probably have never been led to the depths of your soul. Amen. You really don't know what's in your heart. Amen. Bible will do it for you, though. You don't. You don't know how wicked your heart can be. The scripture says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. God said, I know your heart. Now, how does he do it? The word of God. It judges your motive. Now, if you came in here today because your wife drug you in here, God's motive, he knows that. You know, what ball game? Who's playing who this afternoon? You know, that's all some of you got on your mind. Got a football game, basketball game. There's nothing wrong with football. I like to watch a good football game or a good basketball game. I was watching a fight the other day and a hockey game broke out. <laughs> you know, I'm all for sports, believe me. I played basketball for years, ran track and all that. Sports is good, no problem with sports. But folks, there's some things more important. Amen. There's some things more important. Now, if you came in here today and you, and you know, you, you, you just think, well, you know, the Bible's the Bible. It's just another religious book. It's a Christian book. And, but, but, you know, there's just, it's relative truth. There's just as much truth in, in, in the Bhagavad Gavita or the Koran or the, Kabbal, the Kabbal, Kabbalistic teaching, all of that. Just as much truth in all of it. There's so much truth in the scientific classroom and this and that and this and that. And then God's word begins to speak to you, begins to speak to you, and you really don't want to know the truth. Because I'll, you've never really been put to the test. If you're really what you think you, if you're really made up like you think you're made up, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of that book? You see, the book is alive. You can't run from it. You can't hide from it. And it's going to search your reins. You see, the Gospel of John, folks, the Gospel of John is written so that when you take the living Word of God into your soul, okay, it is going to reveal, it is going to reveal to you what you're made out of. And if you don't believe, it's going to show you why you don't believe. You may have been hurt. You may be mad at God. I've, been, I've met a bunch of people mad at God down through the year. Been a time or two, I probably was mad at him. Anybody ever been mad at God? Just be honest. Confused? Sure. They call it a crisis of faith. That's what they call it. But we're, but we, but you know, I always come back to the Bible. Because the Bible's the word of God. It's alive. It speaks to me. It speaks to me. Why don't you let it speak to you? All these people in here aren't hillbilly nuts. <laughs> We're not all a bunch of, a bunch of dumb, you know, uh, uh, ridge runners. I remember when I was a kid, I went up to Chicago, Illinois one time, went into a, into a, into a, into a store. They wanted me to get some bagels and stuff. I had a bunch of Jews in there. Nothing against Jews. My aunt was married a Jew. I went in there and I said, I'd like to have an order of such and such and such and such. And I was about six, seven years old. It got quiet. You could have heard a pin drop. 
And everybody in that, in, that, uh, in that room looked at me. And I'm telling you before God, this is the truth. And they said, say something. <laughs> they had never heard a little old hick boy talk like I was talking. <laughs> now that's the truth. Lord knows I'm telling the truth. Say something. I'll never forget that. But I'll also remember this. I used to hear people up there talking about a bunch of ignorant hillbillies, ridge runners. They don't know anything. They run around barefoot. They're stupid. They're ignorant. That's what a lot of people up there thought we were. They thought that's all it is. That's as far as it goes down here. Well, I'm going to tell you the truth right now. I'm going to get into a sectional thing, but they got some nutballs up there too, believe me. <laughs> they're everywhere. Amen. Everybody's got their nutballs, right? How many agree with that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start another civil war. Good night. I've got all kinds of friends. I had some best friends I ever had in Pennsylvania, up north, places like that. And I got none of that. None of that. But that's just the way people are. Sectional. You know, use, it, use nothing. And just pass it off. Well, folks, let me tell you something. If you believe the Bible, you have received life and light. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Amen. That's first. Do you believe that he died on the cross at Calvary? Not swoon, but died. Do you believe he died for your sins as your sin substitute? Do you believe that they took his body down and they laid it in a tomb? And for three days, his body lay in that tomb. He didn't lay in there, but his body did. He went down the heart of the earth. And then on the third day, he was raised from the dead. Yes, sir, I believe that. I stake my soul, my life, my future, my happiness, my eternity, everything I am or ever hope to be. I stake it on that. I believe every bit of it. And I've asked him to come into my heart and save my soul and write my name in the book of life. And do you know what he did when I did that? He did. He did. I just gave you the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. Then he rose again according to the scriptures. You believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you have believed what John wants you to believe when he wrote this gospel. If you believe that, then thank God. If you don't believe that, come down here right now. Come down here right now. It's a simple move of faith on your part. Because if you make that first step, he'll make the rest of them. That's the way he is. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this. He said, if you'll ever pick up a load for the Lord Jesus. Spurgeon said, Spurgeon said this in the 1800s. He said, if you ever pick up a load for the Lord Jesus, he'll always get on the other end and carry the heaviest part of it. Amen. That's Spurgeon. Amen. Get up and walk down here. Would you do it? Father, in Jesus' name, I've given the gospel, the simple gospel. And I pray now that whatever happens, happens for your glory. You know who you are. You know what you're doing. You know what this word's for. It's gone forth. I pray you'd bless it now. Anoint it to the hearts of the people. In Jesus' name. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Nobody looking. Would anybody like to get up and walk down here this morning and say, Preacher Lawson, I want to be sure. I don't want to go to hell. I do not want to go to hell. You're smart. If you don't want to go to hell, even, 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 even think you might go to hell. You ought to do something about it right now. Amen. Won't you do it? Just get up and walk down here. We'll meet with you. We'll be glad to pray with you. In the holy name. Anybody? 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 I hope that by this that everybody in here is born again. But I'm, not, I'm just a man. There's no way I can know that. God's the only one who can judge your heart. He's the only one. But there may be some people, and probably are, sitting here right now. You may be scared to death. You may be worried. You don't know what to do. You don't know what to say. Say, what will I do when I come down there, preacher? Don't worry about what you do. Just make your effort to come to him. He'll take care of the rest of it. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. He'll put into your soul what you need. Amen. Would you do it? My Father, I pray now. That your word I know will not return void. It will accomplish that which you please. In thy name I pray. Let's stand up.